You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then, we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no dawn on the internet and get to the facts. This will be part two in a two-part series about progress in America. In part one, we talked about how journalism and news skews our perception of how violent and backwards our country is. In today's episode, part two, we'll explore some theoretical models of how we might measure American progress, ones that don't involve outrage news programming. In the last episode, we asked the question, why did crime go down in the 90s? Like, why was it so high? Why did it start coming down again? I think of the 90s and the real problem with crack cocaine. It's Yeah. I remember watching the show Cops, and every episode, they would pull up on somebody, and they'd, like, find crack in their pockets. And gangbangers, gangs were just flourishing during the 90s because of the crack cocaine business right there's also a question of why did news stations have to become so uh, innovative with their evening news like why did they have to switch to what we see now like it used to just be walter cronkite very quietly blandly reporting on everything or the local news was reporting about you know, squirrel that can jet ski and the local parade. Right. They, they'd, they'd put in a little violence, but for the most part, it was a pretty positive. The weather, the sports, you know. <laughs> yeah, they, news anchors, I mean, they would have the same bland, uh, like, tone about reporting on us landing on the moon as they did for, like, a, a local, like, theft. Like, like somebody gets caught embezzling, and it would be the exact same tone as humanity has stepped forward onto another, you know, heavenly body. Man's dream and a nation's pledge have now been fulfilled. The lunar age has begun. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about um, why programming changed, uh, and we're going to talk about some of the reasons why we think uh, crime might have gone down. And when I say we, I don't mean Todd and I. This is basically just like kind of no-dust stuff, um, but a lot of it comes from um, sources about theories on why crime went down. And like we said in the last episode, we are almost back to 1960s levels of crime, which was half and half again what we got to in the 90s. So it's so, yeah, it's so much less. So you made it through the tough times. Right. We've as a people, we've made it through the tough times, yet we think that the world is collapsing down around us, that that we think that the stuff that happened during the the um, Black Lives Matter protest, that that is on par with normal. Um, So, again, just to recap our numbers, 1960, there was, you know, 1,800 crimes per 100,000 people that doubled in the 1970s, that doubled again to the 90s. We are back down again to 2,500 uh, crimes per 100,000 people. So we're doing pretty darn good. How did it get good again? Like, what changed? Um, speaking of the show, Cops, uh, did you know it started right before the 90s? Oh, I remember that show, man. <laughs> it was cops just beating the shit out of people. Yeah. If they had that show on today, there'd be so many lawsuits. <laughs> They actually, they've, um, they may still have it on. There have been versions of it online where they have, um, instead of having ride alongs where they like, they follow the cops and then they edit everything and then they show it and it's like cops tackling poor people and like beating them with clubs. They now have versions of it that are in a, um, internet studio and they, they just look at like live cameras that are currently going and like a producer is there to make sure they're not showing the most horrifying stuff. Like they'll cut cameras and things like that. Yeah, I've seen those. They have like a host who's an FBI agent. He's like in Richmond, Virginia, right now. Right. I, it's. I think it's more accurate representation wise, but it's not nearly as exciting as 
bad as, boys, bad boys. <laughs> as teeth getting knocked out. <laughs> right. More tackling, please. Um, so one of the reasons, uh, one of the theories of why crime dropped after the 90s was simply the number of police officers hired. Um, in 94, uh, Bill Clinton signed the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, uh, which means $30 billion in federal aid was spent over a six-year period to improve state and local enforcement and prisons and crime prevention programs. Um, so uh, during Black Lives Matter, when people were like, defund the police, and then the second half of that s- statement, which doesn't make it onto a catchy slogan, is, and to put that into prevention programs, part of that was, you know, included in Clinton's bill. Um, the prison population rapidly increased from the 1970s. Um, so as crime went up, imprisonment went up too. Um, the 80s was kind of like the crack cocaine market growth. Um, <laughs> that's that's when the, the boom hit. Um, some, I mean, like the, the crack use and violent crimes kind of go hand in hand, but it also depends on like what county you're in and what city you're in. So you can't draw a straight line from that. And I was thinking about that too, because different hundred thousand people are different. If you're in Compton, California, Detroit, Michigan, it's not going to be the same as <laughs> Malibu. Right. You're even least, least likely. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. How many, how much crack epidemic was affected if you were like in the West Hills here in Portland? Like you're not going to see that much. Um, here's one that I like, uh, changing demographics. We have an aging population. <laughs> Um, if you are in the health industry or the retirement community right now, you know this. America is older. Like we have less young people and more old people than we used to, and that lowers crime. People are too tired to go <laughs> rob each other. They're getting old people. Um, two that I really like as theories about why crime has gone down. Have you ever heard of comp stats? No. It's just something I think it was invented in Chicago. Um, there is a, uh, a great Radiolab episode about this. Uh, basically, it's a system of tracking crime. The, the idea that uh, we, we think of crime as like all criminals are doing all the crimes all the time. Most criminals are barely ever committing any crime. And then one or two are just doing a ton of crime. <laughs> so most pickpockets. Very motivated. Right. Yeah, <laughs> they, exactly. They wrote their goals down. Right. The inventor of crime stats was actually doing it to catch pickpockets on subways and, and subway theft. And he just accidentally stumbled into an amazing computer system that a lot of police stations still use today, like almost unchanged if you ignore the fact that the original was on, you know, bullet paper and and spreadsheets painted, you know, uh, wallpapered on people's walls in the police station. Now we have computers to be like, hey, uh, you know, all these thefts, break-ins are one neighborhood and probably one guy. Um, And then, of course, security technology. Um, before the 90s, we didn't have all these neat uh, car alarms and theft detection services. We didn't have nearly as much of an industry for home burglary and alarms. So we just had a really uh, huge increase in technology. Um, now, Todd, you, you had a note once and you asked, um, why have all the huge creative successes, like, like the innovations come from America? Yeah, you see these places that are just brilliant people. They have more people than we do, very educated people, but the real startups, inventions, a vast majority come from the United States of America. Right. Um, Or the huge creative successes, too. Oh, absolutely. Um, One might think that uh, this episode, these last few episodes that we're talking about progress in America, we have talked crime so, so, so much. But that's because our lens that we see progress is through news. News very often does not cover all of the neat technology that comes out. 
Um, there was, <laughs> it was a couple of years ago, there was a sex toy that ended up winning like the Times Top 100 Tech Awards. <laughs> and it just, you can't cover that. Like the, nobody in CNN is looking at that and being like, yeah, let's give that 10 minutes. Um, but they can cover a murder of seven people in detail. Exactly. That is exactly my point. Um, so yeah, we're, we're Todd and I are going to talk about the real progress. We're going to talk about technology and economy. Um, so our economy used to be built around innovation and I went looking for an answer to this. Why, why is real tech progress? Why does America seem to be such a hotbed for it? Why do we seem to be the leaders of tech innovation? Um, and a lot of this, have, have you ever heard the term, um, like garage inventor? Yeah, absolutely. So. Okay. You, do you, um, have you heard the, t- the story about how vulcanized tires were invented by a guy holding rubber in his fingers and he accidentally dropped it into a hot pan? No, I've not heard that. Sounds inspiring. Yeah. Um, f- uh, fake sweetener, like, um, like, uh, what do you call it? What is some, some sweet fakes? and low? Yeah. One of the fake sweeteners came from a scientist who came home didn't wash his hands after a lab experiment and like touched bread like as his family came out and handed him a sandwich and he started eating and it tasted sweet and that's how we got a non-sugar sweetener is just somebody was a clumsy you know lab tech (laughs) um so in the 1880s and this comes from harvard business review and we're also going to have links from smithsonian mag um in the 1880s most uh inventive activity was exactly what we're talking about people outside uh firms they they weren't connected to major companies um major research labs existed uh like edison uh thomas edison's huge menlo park factory basically where they tested all the light bulbs that didn't work before they got to the one that did um those were not common those were the outlier the bigger inventions almost all of them came from individuals Um, however, we made a change from 1870 to the year 2000. We swapped that. We went from most patents filed for inventions by individuals. So like, that's why we were a hotbed of invention, uh, because the individual could make a patent. I could invent, I could accidentally drop rubber into a pan or I could accidentally eat a sandwich with chemicals all over it. And instead of getting superpowers, I invent sweet and low. Um, we went from that era in the 1880s, and then we went to the year 2000, where 80% of patents um, were done by firms. So the individual, the, the garage inventor, went away. It turns into big business. Exactly. And big funding. They get all this money, and they just create one invention after another, and hope one sticks soon. Right, Exactly. Um, and there, uh, they also say in this article, um, that like there are innovative states. So like you and I know, because we live in, in Oregon, um, we have Silicon forest up here. There's Silicon Valley in California. We have a smaller pocket of competitors who are in tech. Silicon forest involves like Intel lattice. Um, uh, one of the antiviruses is out here. Um, They just have a small area in where we live and they compete. Um, uh, If you're in a state like Massachusetts um, from 1900 to 2000 had four times as many patents as less innovative states um, like Wyoming. Um, They would be 30% richer uh, in GDP. Like if Wyoming came out with as many patents They'd be 30% richer um, by the year 2000, according to this article. So there's money in forward thinking and creativity. Yeah. If you have a bunch of garage inventors living in your uh, city or town, you can expect to be a richer city or town for it. People will come there and set up businesses. People will want to come and become industry leaders. Um, people so, will buy parts from these people. Yeah. If, if people listen to us talk about, uh, you know, how Amazon sets the pace for, 
you know, uh, abusing their workforce and paying them, you know, exactly the amount it'll take them to be locked into a job. You may think we are anti-capitalist on this podcast. It's the opposite. We love innovation, and this is exactly why we should have more individual innovation and why it helps a city or a, um, a state having innovation. It, it really does increase, like, the GDP for that area. Um, so what are some of the key elements of American culture that make up the secret sauce of innovation? Yeah, why would somebody want to not get a job and make their comfortable living? Why would they want to risk so much? Right. Uh, um, and, and why aren't other countries doing this? You would think that... Yeah, they could model it, right? Right. Why aren't there, you know... Uh, I mean, if we have states that are like, you know, Massachusetts is great for inventing, why isn't there like a province in China that is the hotbed of invention? Why isn't there a Silicon Valley over in Great Britain? And I'm sure there are versions of it. Um, one of the reasons in America is the forgiveness of failure. I personally oh, I like love that. This. Why? Yeah. <laughs> um, we Americans have a huge tolerance for risk and a huge appetite for crazy off the wall ideas. When I hear about Google providing beanbag chairs and you know um, gourmet lunches to their people. I, as an American, I want to hear that that works. Like, for, for no reason other than it's quirky and fun, I want to think that must bring on innovation, right? But on the other on the other side of the coin, these other countries, these people are afraid of being ridiculed, looking ridiculous, being embarrassed. Right. Um, we Americans, we don't have any pride. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we really Amer- don't. <laughs> Americans have pride. We, we just, we consider failure to be a mark of somebody who is working. We look at a pile of failures and we're like, see, that person's hard at work. Um, we had an episode where we talked about Troy Hurdlebeast, the bear uh, fighter, the guy that built bear proof armor. Nobody will ever need to fight a bear. Nobody will ever need bear-proof armor unless you're immediately facing a bear. Um, but we liked it. as like that, that story was huge here in America because we like the, the lone inventor in a garage tinkering. We, we like that as a narrative. Um, try selling that level of risk to a Finnish bank or a Chinese government official. If you, if you say... I'm going to um, make, you know, thousands of models that don't work before I find the best. You're going to be ejected from the bank. You're not going to get a loan or the Chinese government will tell you knock it off. Yeah, the Chinese government will back something that they know there's going to be a return on investment. These angel investors in Silicon Valley, they expect three out of ten to make it and seven out of ten to be bust. And they don't know which one it's going to be. So they have to invest evenly in all of them. Right. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to quote here. Uh, this is from John Cow from this Harvard business. Um, he's a Harvard business professor and he is um, being quoted in Smithsonian mag. And a lot of what we're talking about is directly taken from his words, his article. Uh, he says, quote, uh, and a willingness to listen to ideas, no matter how outlandish has been the seed corn for countless ventures that are now seen as mainstream. So when we talk about we're willing to risk and we're willing to overlook failure, that is the American version of progress. We step over just hundreds of burning wreckages of cars before we find the Ford automobile. High threshold for pain and embarrassment. That is the new title of our show. Uh, <laughs> we're changing the re-engineered you to high threshold for <laughs> for pain and embarrassment. It sounds like fantasy fiction writers to me. Yeah, it, it, it very much is. You have to give, you have a lot of rejection coming to you if you ever want to be a writer. Um, so here's a good metric for how bad it is in America. How does it look outside? Like outside your door. If you open your door, how's the water? Is it drinkable or is it Flint, Michigan? Uh, can you get seen by a doctor and not be in debt forever? Um, but more importantly, can you invent a better cell phone case and not be put in a government gulag for it? Uh, or have it copied legally? Like um, there are some Chinese factories that straight up don't have um, uh, in- invention and patent laws where they can actually... Uh, there's uh, a bunch of these tech, uh, tech cons 
and tech shows where they fear Chinese inventors showing up at their doorstep because they're allowed by their own local law to just copy it, uh, copy whatever you've built. Um, Public and that, domain. Yeah, exactly. That last one, the um, you know the the idea of not having your invention copied. Um, that's starting to count less and less the more we let corporations become duopolies. We could do an entire show on duopolies. If you ever want to look it up, I encourage it. It's the notion that Coke and Pepsi aren't actually competing with each other. They are just stomping out competition. They don't need to invent anything. They've invented all they ever need personally. They're, hold, now, they're holding hands and they're, <laughs> they're in this together. Right. <laughs> the worst thing for either one is that they go, the other one goes out of business. Right. If you ever look up the phrase duopoly, you will be horrified by how many uh, whole industries are just two major companies who have agreed to compete on the surface. They are like play acting. They're like on a stage with wooden swords, making the motions like they're competing. What they're actually doing is they are stomping out innovators. So those garage innovators that drop rubber into hot pans and invent vulcanized rubber or they accidentally stumble into sweet and low. Um, in today's market, it would be the job of a duopoly to come by, pay that guy about a thousand bucks, and then put him out of business forever. That garage inventor would never have a factory. They would never be a competitor. Um, please look up duopolies. We we might do a show about them. Uh, this this show, Reengineered You, is about helping the individual become better. So we're not going to dwell on it too much, but I do encourage you to to look up duopolies if you have time. So how do we measure progress in America? If it's not crime, it's not what we hear in the news, and it's not creative inventions. So this is where our show gets kind of fun and uh, navel-gazy and future-looking. We're going to, Todd and I are going to plant our shoes on the rock and put our hands up to our, our brow and we're going to look off into the future. <laughs> um, and we're going to pose like that for a while to make ourselves feel smart. Um, there was a, a fortune.com article uh, talking about how the best measure for progress is GDP compared with the prosperity of a middle class family and how many proper prosperous middle class families there are. Um, so we're going to pause there because that is a really good question. And that seems to be what economists for the last 10 years have really been focused on. Not the super mega rich and not the poor poor, but yeah, the, the middle class families, like if we compare gross domestic product and how the country is, is doing financially, how the, how our bank looks like how our, how our national account looks, um, versus, uh, you've heard the term the shrinking middle class. Oh, absolutely. I see it. When you when you envision the middle class, what do you think of in your mind? I think of that like suburban house with the fence, the two cars in the garage, two kids. That's that's kind of what I think of too. I think of I have the the 1950s vision in my head where the lower class is anyone working as a school janitor. Sorry, school janitors, if you're listening to this podcast. And and my cartoonishly wrong picture in my head of the middle class is anyone who works a factory job and has like a couple of kids. Yeah, and has a vacation every year, you know. Yeah. Not living it, paycheck to paycheck. If you are a wealthy uh, rapper, uh, you show it by having gold grills and spinners on your car. If you are a middle class American, you show it off by having kids. That is actually like your, that's you stunting. That's, that's you, you have a kid on your hip. <laughs> that is your version of like you know, fancy sneakers. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a wealth flex. <laughs> Kids are, are a wealth flex for the middle class. Um, and if, if you think I'm being absolutely ridiculous, um, that is actually what a lot of economists look at when they look at middle class is um, education level, college education level, and um, children. Um, so middle class is something we kind of focus on a lot. Uh, and I'm not an economist. Neither is Todd. Todd, are you an economist? <laughs> no. Oh, damn it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just making sure. Um, yeah. So 
middle class is sort of a, a lot of the references we use for um, progress. But here's a little bit of problem with that just from like a outsider's perspective. If your measurement for progress in America is how many people are in the prop- prosperous middle class, then there's nowhere up from there. Like if, if everybody is working a factory job, they have two kids, a picket fence, um, and they are flexing on the rest of us by having those children in a van, um, where's up from there? Um, that's when you basically start comparing GDP again. Um, because if you're living in, say, like New Zealand and you have those things in a middle class, we don't have middle classes here in America anymore. Uh, we do. It's just very small and hard to find. But if you're in a country that currently has a middle class, then you have to start looking at happiness. You have to start looking at things that reflect human welfare and social well-being. And that's where we get into our next article we're going to reference, uh, one from Green Biz. And Green Biz thinks that to measure progress, we should replace GDP and instead use things that look at... Um, have, you, have you heard of the happiness index? Yes, we, we did a show on it. Yeah, we've, we've talked about it. Do you think that happiness is a good measure for progress as a whole? I think so. Comfort and happiness. I, I think so, too. Actually, I'm going to go touchy-feely on this. Because if you're happy, that means you've got to have like health coverage, right? Yeah. Like not. you can't be you can't be happy if you don't have prospects for a future. It's just hard to measure though. Yeah. Yeah, if if you're going around asking everybody are you happy, your day is a uh, a census taker is a pretty good day. Yeah, shelter, food, clothes, health care. Yeah. You're not worried about just basic survival. It's not like you're going to have a country that is like literally on fire and just everyone is going to be like, I'm happy as the, you know, the <laughs> as their home burns behind them and health coverage goes down the tubes. If you are living in a country where everyone says they're happy and their livelihoods are being eaten away and you know there's no health coverage, you get sick and you are in debt forever, you're living in North Korea, um, you cannot have happiness unless you also have health, job security, uh, and prospects for the future, education. Um, hope. <laughs> hope, yeah. I think it, that might actually be it, Todd. I, I think that our best our, our best measure for progress might just be summed up as hope. Yeah, a better life for our kids than we have. Yeah. And everything, all our needs met. Yeah. I wish we could end the episode just by saying hope, and then, like that, that is a very nice, yeah. Play the sound of like a you know, uh, Harp. bells tinkling, <laughs> harps playing. Um, I'm going to try to trump uh, or, or to over, to outdo hope as a measurement. Um, I found a obscure data website uh, by a guy named Jordan Bean, who had a really neat idea. Um, so, have you seen sports? Uh, analytics where they make a composite combining um, all the things that would qualify a good team. Oh yeah. They've got that down to a science. Yeah. So yeah. like how's their defensive, how's their offensive, how's their yeah special teams, things like that. They give them different kinds of interviews for different things. Wonder look test. They, they, they got it down. What if we did that for America? Give it like an IQ test for <laughs> quality of life. <laughs> Well, we have we have IQ tests across the board, yeah. Um, I I kind of love this idea just because I love data and analytics. But then again, I don't know if it would actually do anything except make me happy. Um, one of the things uh, Jordan Bean says is uh, combine all the things that might measure quality of life. Now he includes GDP on this. Um, he includes a, a lot of other things that I felt were unnecessary. Um, you can sort of uh, make up your own mind. We have a, a link to it called uh, Towards Data Science, where he breaks down everything he wants to include in this. But we include productivity hours as a nation, health, intelligence, median household income, self-reported happiness. Um, basically, he wants to like mega data this whole thing, combine everything, average everything based on its importance and like put it together. Um, he mentions that 
So have you have you heard the theory in sports that we can't run any faster, like as humans? Yeah, I've heard that. Um, there are some people who make it their their goal to ruin our fun in sports, and they've taken like statistics about um, if runners who broke records uh, thirty years ago had the exact same tennis shoes, they would be as fast as we are now. That we may not actually be getting better at sports, we or, may just be getting better equipment or the same diet, you know, right? Same equipment, same training, doing it for as long, which they didn't back in the day, <laughs> right? Yeah, if you're an Olympian, fifty years ago, you just picked up the sport. You just found out you were yeah, good at you it. worked it on the weekends after you were a garbage truck driver. You didn't. That's not all you did, <laughs> right? <laughs> um. So there, there is something uh, Jordan Bean mentions in this article that he thinks we've peaked in several of those categories already, like sports and, and how fast a speed skater can move on ice. Um, you know, he talks about how we may have peaked in, in a couple of these little categories uh, that measure quality of life. Um, is there, let's just for fun, let's name one uh, that we think that we've peaked in as Americans. I think intelligence. I think because people are reading less and just kind of going to YouTube videos, if it, YouTube videos over two minutes, or they watch one YouTube video say, I've studied this, I wrote a book on this. I think maybe consumer speed. I think between how warehouses work now, how distribution works now, literally the only thing that can make us faster in like the speed of our economy uh, would probably be like dropping boxes on people by flying drones. Um, like... Or um, was it was it Philip K. Dick or Heinlein was like, everything is going to be pneumatic tubes eventually. <laughs> we will have those bank tubes going to everyone's house and your eggs will all show broken, be, show up at your front door broken because they will have throttled through a tube for miles. Well, I don't know. I mean, Amazon's getting so fast now. I almost think you're going to push that button and they're just going to drop it on your door. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I don't know that we as Americans have peaked in progress for any one specific measure. Um, but I do know that us being fixated on um, misinformation and violence, those have not peaked. In fact, it's gone the other way where we are kicking ass in how peaceful things have gotten. In the TV series, The 100, after being asked why a group of people would persist in a task they know is fruitless, the character, Gaia, has a throwaway line. Sometimes, belief is stronger than the truth. Meaning, even when presenting evidence, we will still choose to believe in events that probably won't happen. With all the biases we've mentioned, survivorship bias, availability bias, mere exposure biases. It's easy to think the human brain is built to believe in the unlikely because the unlikely is exciting, terrifying, or fantastic. Winning the lottery stirs our imagination and we see winners on TV all the time. So half of all Americans buy a state lotto ticket each year despite the chances being about one in 250,000. And we see people being hurt in violent crimes on the news every night. So we estimate our chances of being robbed at about 15%, even though it's a lot closer to 1% throughout our entire lifetime. In other words, instead of asking our neighbors how safe they feel, if you've seen any lions or tigers prowling around, we base our chances, our safety, on what the news says. And if you listen to the TV news, which is staffed by journalists who are openly political and trained and rewarded to hone in on violent stories, you hear about how progress in America is stalled. And violent death, despite being statistically unlikely, is lurking around every corner. When it comes to progress, we should stop asking the hammers if our house is done yet. Instead, take a look for ourselves. 
because the real measure of progress in America should be our health, our income, and our local sense of safety. When you watch the news and all you see are flaming gas stations and crime scenes, just take a walk through your neighborhood. And let me ask you this, can you see Brian Williams' chopper going down? You've been listening to The Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com. That's where we have research links, show notes, and blog articles for each of our episodes. We also appreciate feedback, and we love spirited debates. Joe's been plugging uh, Radio Lab, which is an awesome podcast, but I don't think you should plug them anymore until they plug the re-engineered you. <laughs> I'm in. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. Thank you.